Um, I'm John Boyd. I'm going to talk about code reviews. And uh, somebody mentioned earlier that I'm talking into the sunset. So if I'm distracted, it's because I'm marveling. I'm from Seattle, and I'm watching the sun, which I haven't seen in weeks, go down. It's so beautiful. <laughs> Um, before I jump into this, I'm curious, who am I talking to? How many people here are developers? I write code. Testers, some of my tester brothers out there. Oh, yes. PM, marketing, management. Ah, okay, excellent, excellent. Welcome. Um, so I was reading the, uh, reading the bios of the other speakers here, and there are some awesome people. I think Justin Bieber was here. I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> but I noted that uh, I... Huh? So you saw him too. <laughs> uh, so I, I didn't introduce myself on the uh, on the speaker bio. So I'm going to say a few words about myself. <clears throat> uh, well, I'm John. I'm a senior security engineer, at security innovation. I break things. Coolest job ever. Uh, before joining SI, I worked at uh, various companies: uh, Disney, Microsoft, uh, Veritas. Ended up getting bought by Symantec. I have an undergrad in computer science and a master's in software engineering. So not only do I like to break things, I like to write code to break things. And we're going to see that here in a few minutes. Um, I have a CISP and some other certs. Uh, <laughs> all right. So this is what we're going to talk about. I ran into a problem. And I'm going to explain kind of what that problem is, some of the things I tried. And uh, what worked, what didn't, and we're going to talk about some patterns of how things fail. And for me, this is, this is why I got into computers, was watching things fail. So let's give this a shot. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I did my undergrad, grad school, but I went to high school at a, uh, a school in Maine called the Maine School of S&M, and, uh, it, science and math. And <laughs> while I was there, I took a course in C++ and algorith algorithms and data structures. And towards the, end of the, towards the end of my cycle, I wrote a program that read in a text-based maze and parsed the maze. And then I wrote some AI to solve the maze and print out the result. And when I turned it in, I felt like a god. I was amazing. I am the best programmer ever. Fast forward a little wise. I did my undergrad. And in my undergrad, I, um, I wrote a program. It's about 2,000 lines long. It was a uh, kernel mode network time synchronization protocol, uh, complete with you know kernel mode driver, user mode service, sockets, you know integration into Windows. It was, I mean, it was a little tipsy, uh, but it worked, and I was proud of myself. I was like, this is even better than the Maze Solver program. Fast forward a little bit further, went to grad school, started consistently writing programs and projects that were 20,000 lines, lines long. I wrote a, a network backup product with uh, you know, encryption and distributed objects and database backends. And I realized that that was about the limit of the amount of code that I could page into my brain at one time. Like, that was it. Anything over you know, was something else. So these days, I work on uh, assessments. I break things. I also do a lot of code reviews. And, uh, you know, it's not uncommon for somebody to come in and be like, here is all of our code. Find vulnerabilities. And, you know, I'll do a, I'll do a word count or whatever, and it comes back with, you know, five million lines of code. And, you know, my, my little meat brain kind of overloads at that point. I'm like, I have no idea what I'm doing. I don't help. Um, and ultimately, you know, it comes down to looking for a needle in a haystack. So what do we need? Magnets, right? How do they work? <laughs> uh, so we're going to talk about magnets. So what I tried, uh, first thing I tried was, you know, getting a list of all the files and opening up the first file and reading it line by line by line. And uh, that didn't go well. Um, I may have passed out. We're not sure. Uh, so then I tried some kind of basic scripting. You know, let's, let's see what I can do. Uh, then I tried some really super duper advanced scripting with AI and scary algorithms that I learned in grad school. And it turns out that worked a little bit. And then I did some, uh, you know, more parallel optimizations to that and uh, more targeted scripting. And this is kind of what we're going to talk about here. Oh, right on. So I mentioned that reading line by line, file by file. Is uh, Srini here? Oh, I was hoping he'd make it. Um, so kind of what I had initially thought would work was I'd, I'd read line by line, file by file, and I'd assume that if it was insecure, I'd know it when I saw it. But you know, it's 
perhaps a little bit true. I mean, I, I do find patterns of insecurity, but maybe not so much. So I decided, you know, I'm, I'm going to start writing a script to try and find vulnerabilities. And when I did this, I needed to know what were the exact patterns of things that were going to break. You know, what, what exactly is, you know, SQL injection or cross-site scripting? And, you know, what are those across? Like, what are all of the ways that a developer can shoot themselves in the face? Or foot, sorry. And um, so in, in a former life, I, uh, I had worked for Microsoft. And when you're at Microsoft, you drink the Kool-Aid. And the Kool-Aid says that anything written in C-sharp is secure. <laughs> and so you know, I was on a C-sharp project going and trying to think of all the ways that a developer can shoot themselves in the foot in C-sharp. And it turns out that you can do it. So I went through and started enumerating. You know, what are the things that I can, I can do? And you know, the first place I go is you know, the OS top 10 and you know, the top 25, and then the CWE list, looking for basically inspiration on what are some patterns that I can grab for, what are some patterns that I can look for. So let's, let's play a game. Uh, let's assume that we've got an ASP.NET website, and page validation is turned off. So if I throw in some cross-site scripting, it's not going to pop saying this is a dangerous query. And let's say you know, I've got um, 5 million lines of code, and I grab for response.write and star.cs, I'm leaving out the syntax of recursive and stuff. Uh, pipe to grep for request. And this will find that. So when I first thought of this, I'm like, okay, I'm on an engagement. Nobody would ever do this. Like, this is the wrong thing to do. And it turns out that some developer had left, left in some debug code. And I was actually able to file a, an issue on this. Like, hey, you know, maybe there's another way of doing this. Um, it doesn't find stuff like let's take the user input and assign it to a string, and then somewhere later we're going to or, you know declare a variable string type, assign it to evil user input, and then later on in the code we'll write that out. So I, I think the, the the buzzy jargon is you know the source and then the sync. So I thought well gee you know I I, I can solve that. Uh, let me do a little bit of C sharp magic and extract all the variables that are assigned user input and then extract all of the lines that represent scary method invocations. So things like process.start, response.write, um, you know, file.delete. You know, there, there, there are a bunch of things where you know, if a user gets a hold of it from user input, he can mess up the server. Um, and then you know, from there I was able to say, okay, for each evil variable, I'm going to call it evil variable, something that has user input. Uh, for each for scary possible method, you know, does, scary, does the line contain scary method and evil variable? And it turns out this, it kind of works. I mean, it's not fortify or, you know, check marks on one of these super, you know, static, static analyzers, but it kind of works. And uh, it works particularly well for PHP. Um, and I'm like, oh, okay, well, that's, that's interesting. But it fails for you know, larger scenarios. Like let's say that I take user input and assign it to a variable and then invoke a method on a different class in a different file, not in this file. You know, grep will not find that if you're just grepping through files one at a time. So fail. So when I realized this and I, I started kind of going down the rabbit hole, I started writing code to parse code. Now I, I write code the same way every time. And my code is super maintainable and easy to read. I mean, I'm, I'm not really that smart, so I don't try and get fancy. But it turns out a lot of developers measure their self-worth in the ability to write code that I can't read. <laughs> <laughs> and if I can't read it, my code trying to parse their code is not going to make it. It's like, it fails. Who writes an inline delegate for an anonymous, I just, no. Uh, so I, I, I was trying it. I tried it again. I tried it again. It wasn't working. And uh, I ended up at DEF CON. And uh, one of our guys, uh, Dennis Cruz, sat with me at DEF CON. And he's like, what you need is something that will generate an abstract syntax tree. I'm going to talk about an abstract syntax tree in a second. But we, we sat down over coffee and had a two-hour conversation on you know, code parsing and code analysis. And he pointed me to um, a library, open source library, I think. Yeah, pretty sure. Um, called Henry Factory. And what Henry Factory will do is it will read in source code and it will kind of annotate it for you into something called an abstract syntax tree. And all that is is here's the source code, you know. Well, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, basically, during that conversation, there were some finer points of doing code or doing static code analysis. 
And these are some of the some of the finer points. And we're going to talk kind of each about we're going to talk about each of these. Uh, and then he ran out of oxygen and passed out. I don't know what happened. Um, so you know, abstract syntax trees. You know, being able to create a graph of flow through the code, like this function calls this function calls this function, um, and then you know, figuring out where the data is flowing from this user input through this function through this function through this function, and then being able to write some AI or some state space search algorithms. And again, we're going to talk about this in a minute uh, to be able to trace through this. It sounds easy, right? Um, so I mentioned abstract syntax trees, and you know basically this is code, and then what is this code? So for example, this is a method invocation. Uh, this is a class declaration. Uh, this is a variable assignment. This is you know a variable instanti or a object initializer instantiation. So using this, I, I went through the source tree, and I read in each of the files and created these abstract syntax trees. So I created a uh, disjunct forest data structure. I am a software engineer by training, and I like algorithms. Like programmers write code, software engineers implement algorithms. So um, basically I got a forest of these abstract syntax trees. And my, my next step was, well, now I need to link these together. You know, I have nodes that represent class and method. And then inside that method I have all of the invocations. And each invocation points to another node in another class. So, you know, what do we do? We connect the dots, right? Uh, and in this we're creating a control flow graph. So for each node in this tree, figure out what class does it reference, what method in that class does it reference, and then make a link to it. And in this way we can kind of create a, a CFG. So the code for this is actually pretty complex. Um, oh, by the way, uh, I'm going to show you guys some tooling after this. Uh, one of the awesome things about what I do is I get to open source everything that I do. So all of this is on GitHub. I'm not like trying to sell a product. This is actually open sourcey stuff. So let's talk about state space search, search algorithms. Let's say that we've got this graph of you know this class, this method invokes this class, this method invokes this class, this method. What we'd like to be able to do is find from the source to the sink and be able to trace through this. And what we need to do is implement some AI. And you know, when you, you start talking about AI, people are like, oh, that's scary. You know, it's going to take over the world and you know, imprison us. And no, it's actually just another set of algorithms. I'll, I'll be a cat-like algorithms. So <clears throat> there are a couple of different uh, versions of state space search algorithms. So for example, you have a depth first search. Let's say that you're starting at the top. Let's say this is a, this is a node for user input. And you take the first node, the first method invocation. And then from there you look at all the method invocations and take the first one. And then from there you take all the method, in whoops, all the method invocations and take the next one. And let's say that there's some evil little, you know, function like process.start that you were passing this user input through. Here you just, you know, print out an error message, or not an error message, print out a, a message saying, hey, you know what, we know what the, the call stack is. And we think there's something wrong here. You should probably be doing something less scary. But there's an alternative. Uh, breadth first search. So in this you have, you know, you're starting user input and you take the first invocation, check to see if it has anything. Nope. Take the second invocation. Does it have anything scary? Process.start, file.delete. Nope. Okay. Now let's go down a level. Any of these? Down a level. Oh, we got a process.start here. Let's throw an error. Or let's write a, a, a vulnerability. So for completeness, uh, there's an additional algorithm, and this is A star, and this is really a heuristic-based search algorithm, similar to the first two, except where the first one might be implemented as a stack, and the second one might be implemented as a queue. This would be impl implemented as a priority queue, where the closeness by some heuristic to user input might be some function. So I'm not going to talk about this. This is not useful for what we're talking about, but I include it for completeness. So now we have a graph and we have an AI that can traverse this graph. We need the AI to understand good versus evil. And you know, we see that evil is you know, a new comma uh, SQL command or a new process or a response.write line. Um, and these are just rules. 
that the AI fires when it reaches a node. Like, hey, does this rule work for XSS? Are we passing it to an evil XSS? So the result, um, and again, this is all open source, so we'll get to that in a minute, is we have a, a script that searches the file system for source code, parses that source code into a usable graph, and then queries that graph for vulnerabilities, and if it finds something, it'll give you a stack trace of, hey, here's the user input, it follows through this function, this function, this function, and here's where it's doing something scary. So there's good news and bad news. The good news is it works. It does find security issues, and it doesn't require that the source code compile. There's no reflection. So for example, FXCOP, um, you, it actually relies on reflection, at least in C Sharp. Uh, the bad news is I ran it on 20,000 lines of code and it took eight hours. Who here wants to wait for eight hours to determine if there's an error? <laughs> right? I didn't either. I was like, oh man, this is so slow. I'm a bad programmer. Um, but we live, we learn. And, oh, cool. It turns out that there's some optimizations that I was able to make in... Uh, kind of an alternate version of that. And I'll talk about that. But what I'd like to do now is give you a live demo. So, who here thinks it's going to pass? Is it going to su succeed? Yes, somebody believes in me. <laughs> All right, let's give it a shot. Um, so for those in the know, uh, Static Code Analysis Tool, SCAT. Uh, no, actually... Cool question. Uh, is it a Visual Studio plugin? Um, I thought about that after I wrote this. And so one of the things I'd like to do in the future is extend Visual Studio to do this. But for now, it's just a Windows Form application. Um, and bear in mind, I'm a penetration tester. You know, I, I know how to write code, but you know, if you want Fortify or check marks, you know, there, there are people, other people that you can talk to. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up a source file. I'm sorry, not a source file. A, uh, I've written a, a web application. Called Oops. And don't crash, don't crash, don't crash. We're going to run this, uh, this tool. It scans the source code. Looks for vulnerabilities. It runs this kind of AI algorithm. I have some uh, some debug stuff here. You can pretty much ignore that. But let's let's take a look at see what it found. Uh, various uh, informational uh, medium, and then you should probably look at this so you can navigate down. And over here, you can see something that looks a lot like a call stack. And I never really understood what a call stack was until I had to write one, and now I understand why it's from the bottom up. Um, but if we look at this, let's say this, we can see that it is taking username and just blatantly concatenating it into a SQL command, um, originating from, you know, a page.load. Um, so, yeah, we can kind of look around. Um, this does have the simple rules. You remember where I said, let's just see if we can parse out the, the variable names without having to do the whole abstract syntax tree stuff because that's faster. So a lot of these will actually show up twice um, because you know it found it one way and it found it another way. Uh, so that is uh, the static code analysis tool. Uh, this is on GitHub. Um, you can laugh or point at the code, uh, but you can't do both. <laughs> All right, so let's move on. How much? Yeah, I got plenty of time. So this uh, this does C sharp, and it does uh, a little bit of PHP. Um, and we're actually going to talk about something a little cooler, not cooler, different in a second. Where we're going to start dipping into uh, native code. Cool. Excellent. Uh, no Java support, uh, but only because I haven't really been on a Java project where I can, you know, run into cycles where I can do it. I mean, I'm, I'm hoping someday uh, I'll have the opportunity, but you know, so far not so much. Next one. Yeah, the next one. All right, so you know we we discovered that it worked, but we discovered it was really slow. Um, 
one of the great things, that, and I think I mentioned this about C Sharp 4.0, is uh, you know there's some awesome parallelization libraries. And I used to uh, I used to write kernel code for Windows, and I've written a lot of things with threads and mutexes and semaphores and kind of thread synchronization primitives. And that code gets ugly fast. It's incredibly painful. Uh, it turns out that you know there's a library that just parallelizes everything, parallelizes everything. And so I started making use of that. And uh, Mark can actually speak to that. I like to parallelize everything, parallelize all the things. My life is an abuse case. What can I say? <laughs> so my next project uh, turned out to be native code. And in native code, I started dipping into uh, C and C++ uh, for Linux user and kernel mode code, and then kind of the Win32 Windows platform user and kernel mode code. So my goal was to go and find vulnerabilities in those. You know, here's a bunch of C written for Windows kernel or, you know, Linux kernel or whatever it is. Whoever wants to extend it, uh, have fun. <laughs> Okay, so, you know, when all you have is a hammer, you know, everything looks like a nail. So I, I start by going and enumerating what can go wrong. And, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that can go wrong in native languages. Well, how do I enumerate user input? How do you enumerate user input off of a custom dev control in a driver? How do you input or, you know, get user input from a custom ioctal in the Linux kernel? Or an arbitrary file read? And I started realizing that there are just there's so many ways of getting user input that I can't possibly do that in the amount of time that I have. You know, you have five minutes, you implement a quick class, you can't do it. So, you know, you're enumerating user input, no, nah, I mean, that's kind of a bust. Uh, there's also no safe AST generator. I mentioned that Dennis had pointed me to in refactory. Well, there's, there's not one, you know, freely available for C++ or C. I could write one, but that's incredibly painful. So, <clears throat> um, I was reading some code, and I realized as I was I was reading through this code that this code was less secure than WebGoat. Um, and I, I had to ask I, I had to step back and ask myself, you know, was it developed by C programmers or was it developed by Java or C sharp devs, kind of the managed guys that don't really understand the intricacies of writing native code? And one of the, as, as I was looking at this, I started to realize that a, a metric for how safe or how secure a product is, is how many stir copies. I mean, I, I, I looked at one thing where there were three stir copies and there were comments above them saying, this has been reviewed by so-and-so on this particular date and it looks okay. Uh, another one where there were a thousand stir copies, you know. Um, So I don't have an AST. I don't have user input. You know, I'm, I'm doing it on, you know, a, a kind of a cross-platform in native code. Uh, so I started thinking about what were, what were some of the patterns that I can come up with? What are some of the patterns that I can think of to cause a failure? And so these are some of the patterns. We're going to talk, I mean, I'm going to briefly talk about these, and I have uh, another script that I need to integrate with this. But, um, you know, we're going to talk about insecurely executing commands. Uh, Unicode stack smashes, race conditions, deadlocks, mm, and some other stuffs. Stuff. All right, so let's let's take a look at the first one. This one uh, I've actually been seeing for several years, and it's it's kind of weird. Um, let's say that you have a product. This is a hypothetical product, but let's say that it's running as root on a system, multi-user system, and maybe it goes to each of the home directories. And it executes the first line of code, ls minus l, uh, pipe 2. Maybe it's looking for, you know, excess file usage or something. I don't know. But it's doing something on each home directory. Management. Uh, what's wrong with the first line, right? So let's say that the path, let's say it's running as root. Let's say the path is dot colon slash bin slash sh. Or, you know, colon slash user slash bin. But if there's an, a file named ls in the home directory, it's going to pick that up and run it as root. This is scary. Okay, so let, let's fix this. Let's say, uh, let's, let's actually hard code. I mean, so this is one of the patterns that I'm looking for in native code. Like it doesn't require user input. It doesn't require user output. Uh, but let's, let's fix it. Now we have slash bin slash ls. Uh, and that, that doesn't fix it either because they're piping it into awk. And... 
well, if I just have a, a program called awk in the directory instead of ls, you know, we fixed part of it, but we didn't get it all. Uh, so let's, you know, take it a step further. Bin ls, uh, pipe2 slash bin slash awk, and the question becomes, why are we using a system to do this? Right? Um, I can't tell you, <laughs> but they removed the entire product and had to rewrite it. So the question was who has dot in their environment path for root anyway? Speaking of which, um, cool Windows example, where does this DLL come from? Like, is there a safe, trusted path where you go and find DLLs? Is it just the current directory? Is this, I mean, are there, is there even an MD5, or not an MD5, a, a hash check of this to see if it's been modified? No, it's just, hey, let's load a library that's right there. Um, so, in native languages, you would do a malloc or a free. Um, and malloc, it turns out, can return null. Uh, new might throw. But let's say that you're looking at something in a kernel mode driver for Windows, and this is effectively a malloc, except it's uh, you know, a different kind of malloc. So what we're doing is we're allocating a buffer and we're setting the zeroth byte to hex 41. In a low memory condition, this will return null and this will result in an access violation, which will cause a KE bug check which will blue screen the box and effectively denial of service it. But it turns out, you know, you can totally do this with, you know, malloc or, you know, sysallocate string or stir dupe or any of these and it's kind of a fairly easy check. Like, did you actually get the memory? <coughs> um, this one's actually kind of cool. I mean, string copy, stir copy is bad, right? Like, it's still bad. It, it never started being good. Um, but it turns out, I, I'm going I'm to look at this one a little more carefully. Um, Unicode conversion. Let's say that we need uh, one byte to represent a character, hex 41, uh, versus two bytes, hex 0041. Um, so a WCHAR, for those uninitiated in systems programming, uh, is two bytes per character, dest of 256. And what we're going to do is we're going to take some user input string as an ASCII string, and we're going to convert that to... Unicode, so multi-byte to, you know, two bytes. And, you know, we need the size of the buffer they're going to copy into. This. So, so the size of dest is the size of dest, which is, no, 512. Size of returns the number of bytes. Um, which means that they're passing in 512 saying this buffer, this buffer is 512 W chars because this reads it as W chars. This is returning the number of bytes. So if you have a properly crafted uh, user input, you can do a stack smash during a Unicode conversion. And I used to think that stack smashes could not be exploitable. And then I, I went to a class by a, a gentleman back here who disabused me of that notion. Sorry to put you on the spot. Um... We just talked about that. I think. Yeah. Um, let's, let's give another example. And again, I'm, I'm showing you these examples and I'm, I'm, I'm going to get to a point here in a moment. Uh, but let's, let's take a look at this. Um, so we have a function, uh, handle request, and we, we get into the function and we're going to enter critical section. So this is lock or mutex.acquire. And I mentioned that this is hard to get right, which is why I was so happy with the parallelization libraries in C sharp. And then he took a breath. Uh, so let's say that A fails, we leave the critical section, we unlock it, so the next thread can come in and we return. And let's say we do some other stuff. Let's say that B fails and we just return. Let's say that, you know, by the end of the function we leave the critical section and we're done. So there's a bug here. Right? So if B fails, we don't release, we don't leave the critical section. Ultimately, this can result in a deadlock. If I can exercise B fail and get through this, I can deadlock a system and depending on what service this is running in, I may be able to hang the entire system. Or just deny service to that particular, or deny access to valid users for that particular service. So, 
it occurred to me that as you know, as I read through you know various projects and I'm looking at source code, I should probably come up with regression testing. I used to be a, a, a tester. Um, best days of my life. Anyway, um, used to be a tester, and you know, as I'm, I'm reviewing code, I realize that you know I need to have regression tests for this. So I created uh, basic rules similar to the ones that we saw in the static code analysis tool for parsing C++ and C looking for these particular patterns. I skipped over one of the patterns because I don't really want to talk about that. But um, it turns out that because I was able to write these in a way that used these C-sharp parallelization libraries, I was able to go through about 2.9 gigs of code in about 10 minutes. So no more eight hours for you know, 22,000 lines of code. I'm not sure how many lines of code 2.9 gigs are. So <clears throat> let me show you uh, one more demo. And what I'm going to show you is uh, an extension. I haven't integrated it back with the, the other cool GUI tool that I wrote earlier. Uh, so I'm hoping to do that when I next have time. But I'll show you anyway. Um, this one I've not done a live demo of before. So this might fail. And it might succeed. We'll see. So build, debug, start without debugging, file. Um, I have the hard coded, right now I have a hard coded path to the test code. So we'll scan and it comes back and it says things like, you know, hey, you're calling create process insecurely or, you know, the Unicode stack smash pattern. You know, there's a, a leak in, you know, registry handle. Uh, this also looks for handle leaks and memory leaks and various shapes and sizes. Um, so the rules for this, I mean, this, this is a raw kind of a test way for when I write code. Um, we're actually going to be ported back to the other thing, um, which is, as I mentioned earlier, open sourced and free on GitHub uh, from the current slide. So open source all the things. Um, yeah, caveat, native code has, rules haven't been integrated. And uh, I should mention that, you know, again, this is open source. This is, you know, me hacking around. This is not check marks. This is not fortify. You know, I'm not going to stake your organization on this. This is, you know, a tool that I've developed to make my life code reviewing easier and faster and stronger. So the question is, you know, what next after I integrate things? And, you know, one of the things I'd like to do is be able to go from static code analysis to working exploit. I don't know how possible that is, how feasible that is. We'll see. Uh, another possibility is, you know, a Visual Studio plugin. Uh, maybe hit tab, you know, build and it comes up with a security error and you hit tab and it shows you a possible code fix for this. Maybe just an HTML encode or something. And then tab again to complete and actually accept the change into the code. Again, you know, time pending. So uh, that's me. Again, this is on GitHub. Uh, in Refactory was an AST generator for the C-sharp aspect of this. Um, I'm John Boyd.